Welcome into a week one edition of NFL Primetime. Glad you are here with us for what should be a great day of football on oh, ESPN. Yeah. We, of course, being Trey Wingo, Merrill Hodge, and Mark Slareth. Got a double dose of Monday Night Football coming up later on tonight. First game, of course, is the Ravens and Bengals. Second game, of course, out west, Arizona in San Francisco to take on the 49ers. As we will do every 20 minutes throughout this show, we'll get you a 20-minute update on what to expect tonight from those combatants in those Monday Night Football games. And for the very first one, the AFC North Showdown, Rams at Bengals, we say hello to Bob Holtzman. Hello, Bob. Hi, Trey. The Bengals' starting offense really struggled during the preseason. Took them nine possessions just to score their first touchdown. But wide receiver T.J. Hushmanzada told me he's not at all concerned. Said they only ran the most basic of plays because unlike last year when Carson Palmer was coming back from knee surgery, they didn't feel like they had to do much to be ready for tonight. Now, speaking of Palmer, he spent part of the offseason helping Bob Bratkowski, the offensive coordinator, rework a portion of the playbook. He says they dumped some plays that they didn't feel played well with the personnel they had, and they added some other plays. Most of them from the NFL's dynamic offenses like the Colts, Saints, and Patriots. Now for a report on the Ravens, here's Sal Palantonio. Well, as you know, Bob, Carson Palmer has a little, a little bit of a long ball streak going against this Ravens defense. In the last five games, Carson Palmer has hit on a completion of at least 40 yards or more. So what to do about it? Ed Reed, the Pro Bowl safety of the Ravens, says that tonight he will throw at least 60 different defensive looks at Palmer. But one thing won't change, Trey, and that is the pressure. Rex Ryan says, doesn't matter who we play, we will attack. That's what we do. And that is what they've done very successfully over the last few years. All right, Sal, thanks very much. Okay, let's start breaking down these Monday night matchups and let us begin sequentially, sequentially. logically, with the first game, okay. Baltimore and that defense that will always apply pressure going into Cincinnati and, and taking on the, uh, the Bengals. But, Merrill, Baltimore won this division last year, 13 games. Only the Chargers won more. But you have concerns about the front wall of this team, don't yeah, you? Yeah, a lot of concerns with their offensive line. You know, they, they don't have chemistry. You know, that's the one part of football where there's five guys must play together as one. And studying through the preseason, they are not in sync. There is no chemistry there. There is no rhythm there. You know, watch, first of all, the penetration, but the free defenders. So many free defenders. And the guys that concern me are the linebackers that are free. The safeties that come down and are not accounted for, the defensive linemen that do not stay blocked, that is all about a chemistry with an offensive lineman. If you get a double team and you both leave it and the defensive lineman comes and makes the tackle, you're in trouble. Nobody gets to the linebacker, hard to run the football. I saw that consistently throughout the preseason, and I don't think it just gets better tonight. I think it'll still be a problem for the Ravens. Well, especially tonight. when you're flip-flopping guys, tackles. They don't know if Jonathan Ogden's yeah, ready to play, problem. but there's one place where they have consistency, one place you don't have to worry about. That's on the defensive yeah. side of times. the football. Yeah, there's 60 different looks, and some of them are going to look like that. Arr, that's the way they <laughs> I like that look. look. Yeah, that's, that's a Jared, scary look. That's, that's look 32. <laughs> yeah, that's look 32, by the way. Uh, Jarrett Johnson is the guy I'm looking at. Pl replaces a Dallas Thomas, and a Dallas Thomas, great player, went up to New England. He's going to do great things up there, but Jarrett Johnson, one of these guys, six foot three, 270 pounds. He's adept at rushing the passer off the edge. He's got good quickness, good body lean to him. He's also a powerful guy, so he can do a lot of things. One thing you've got to understand about this defense, when you're talking Jarrett Johnson, you're talking about a guy that's going to get singled the majority of the time because you've got guys like Ray Lewis, Bart Scott, and Terrell Suggs on the other side. So when you have those type of names on the other side, you're always going to go 
that's the guy we got to double team. We got to account for that guy. Jerk Johnson going to get a lot of one on one looks and he should thrive. What do you think the first defensive looks going to be? You I think he just did it. I think he just did it. Think just did it. What, what, what other one? I think it's going to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I think it may just be this. That, that, could, that, be, that could be. That may be it. Jared Johnson, by the way, only All those three looks. sacks in four seasons. We'll see what happens. And then there is the second game out west, Arizona going to San Francisco uh, to take on the 49ers. Uh, and the big question for you, uh, changes in the offseason, a lot of them uh, for uh, both the Arizona Cardinals and, of course, uh, the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, you have the 49ers going big money to acquire Nate Clements, mm -hmm. San Francisco $80 million contract to come over from Buffalo. They also get Daryl Jackson to come over from the Seahawks. Uh, and then the 49ers get Patrick Willis, uh, the young linebacker, and then Joe Staley also coming out of the draft. It looks like both these guys are going to start. The Cardinals, of course, the biggest thing there, they get Ken Wisenhunt to take over for uh, the head coaching job after Dennis Green lost it. And there you have what's going on in Arizona. Mark, the biggest question for the Arizona Cardinals, I think, coming into this game and coming into this season is going to be something that they struggle to do all of 2006, right. and that's run the ball effectively. Yeah, and it's an attitude. And every coach that comes in there says, we have to change the attitude of this organization. Kim Wisenhunt, Russ Grimm, the offensive line coach slash offensive coordinator, is going to, I think they're going to be able to do that. When you look at the Arizona Cardinals, they're a team that can't run. And what you've got to be able to do is implement a system. The Pittsburgh Steelers are where they come from. They understand how to run the plays. They also understand how to operate with some gadgets and take some pressure off. And what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to be better up front. Last year, you watched them. Penetration. They absolutely got dominated at the point of attack. Uh, Russ Grimm is going to bring some attitude. Ken Wisenhunt will bring some attitude. The other thing is they're not going to shy away from running the football if they only get two yards of carry for a while. They're not going to scrap it and go away from it. They are going to establish this up front, and they're going to say, we're going to adhere to this, and we're going to stick to this kind of methodology, if you will. Yeah, I think the commitment will be the biggest difference. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be great at running the football like, to say, the Steelers were. But the commitment, if they stay with the commitment, they'll eventually get there. Well, they're going to do better than they did last year with these guys because in 06, they were dead last at 3.2 yards per carry. As for the San Francisco 49ers, you like what you see in the development of the young quarterback, Alex Smith. Yeah, Alex Smith has done a nice job. You know, he's in his third year. And usually in your third year when you've started a year and you've played as well as Alex Smith did and you have a guy like Gore as your back, what you need Alex Smith to do is now win games for you. You have now got to compliment Frank Gore and you've got to take pressure off of him. And I think that's where the 49ers will be. We've showed you the defensive improvements, the draft picks that they have gotten. The defense should be better. The a guy that has to elevate his game in this Monday night game and throughout the season is going to be Alex Smith. I'm sure the 49ers staff went in and said, Alex Smith, we asked you not to lose games for us last year. This year, we need you to win five games. Alex Smith will have to be responsible for winning five games this year. Frank Gore will take care of another five or sure. six. You get it from the other things. You could have yourself a 10, 11 game, uh, 10 or 11 win season, but he has got to elevate his game in order for that to happen. Well, he did that from his rookie year to his second year. Yes. His passer rating almost doubled. And keep in mind, Alex Smith is only 23. Why do I throw that number out there? Colt Brennan, the quarterback at Hawaii this year, 23. is 23. So he's still a young quarterback that is on his way to hopefully being a very good quarterback for a team and a franchise that have had more than their fair share of very good quarterbacks. Uh, meanwhile, we move on. Bills reserve tight end Kevin Everett is in critical condition in a Buffalo hospital right now after suffering a neck injury in the game against the Denver Broncos on Sunday that doctors say is serious. He is under heavy sedation right now and apparently spent four hours of surgery last night in a Buffalo hospital that specializes in spinal and neurological issues. Everett fell to the ground and was never moved after this helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit to open the second half kickoff. He was placed on a backboard with his head and body immobilized and carefully loaded onto an ambulance. The game delayed for about 15 minutes. Just a few moments ago, Bill's head coach Dick Duran on where we are now. It's a dangerous game. And yesterday we saw that and it came, you know, right, right to us, right, right in front of us. And there was one of our teammates uh, down on the field. So it is part of the game and, and we all understand it. We also understand that, as I said earlier, it is what we choose to do and we honor ourselves by our work and we honor Kevin by moving forward and working while never forgetting Kevin and never getting him out of our thoughts and prayers. 
Obviously a very difficult time all the way around in Buffalo. By the way, the agent for Kevin Everett said there has been some sparse movement. The bills say they expect to get an update uh, from their medical staff on Everett's condition later on this afternoon. When we return on this edition of NFL or primetime, the Bears held LaDainian Tomlinson to under 30 yards. The bad news is it didn't matter because their offense couldn't get out of their own way. Plus, a big game under the lights in Big D where there was no D. We'll explain. Welcome back to NFL Primetime. Sunday night in Dallas, Giants, Cowboys, two words, defense optional. This is the last time we'll feature Michael Strahan and the G-Men's unit. Not like Wade Phillips' unit was any better. Uh, very early in the game, Eli to Plexico Burris. Hello, secondary. Where are you? 60 yards later, he's in. The only good news for the Cowboys, Giants missed the PAT at 6 nothing. Second quarter, fourth and one, make that fourth and touchdown mark for Marion Barber. He just has a nose for the goal line. Look at that extra effort right there, and he can get it in. You know he gets down there close, and he just senses it. And again, new rule this year. The ball's got to be inside the pylon. It is. Touchdown, boys up 10-6. More troubles for the Giants in what was a recurring theme. Look at uh. the knee of Brandon Jacobs. A human's knee is not meant to bend that way. He would be taken out, did not return. Tony Romo didn't throw a ball to Terrell Owens in the first half. Think they had to talk about that at halftime? Yes, yeah, they earn it in the second half. And, and he earns it. That was a tremendous catch. Not the best of throws, but a great catch by T.O. Both feet in. Good. But that was a 24 from a great wide receiver. That's, That's what, what you have expect. to have. Uh, and apparently, they worked so well once, they're going to try it again. Yeah, we'll make it a little easier on you. I'm going to let you run after the catch this time, and he does that pretty well. Giants might want to wrap up on that particular play. <laughs> Tackle you know, optional. Free. Cowboys up 38 22. Later in the fourth, Manning. Gets it to Derek Ward and Derek Ward tackling obstacle for the Cowboys. 38 28. Two point conversion follows as they try to get close. Manning can't find anybody. Anthony Spencer buries him on the ground. More importantly than the missed extra point, it appears Eli may have hurt his shoulder on the play. Later in the fourth, after a pick by Tony Romo, Plex, his third of the game. It's a three point game. 38 35. Bad news is. That Eli and company left time on the clock for Tony Romo, and he was just on fire to Sam Hurd. Guy Who? Was, he was, yeah, Sam Hurd, and, the, and Tony Romo was just absolutely money anticipation perfect. 45 35, all good in Big D. Kind of come in here just saying, you know, we're going to kind of feel it out a little bit and do what we do. And, you know, it was good to see that we were able to put up so many points and then and keep attacking. And um, it was a good start. The first half was so like a, a matinee, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Letting everybody, you know, feel in the seats, feel in the stands, and uh, you know, second half, you know, I got my my chance to to shine a little bit. Shoulder, um, you know, it feels just a little tight, a little sore right now. Uh, I think I just bruised it, so you know, I'm gonna get an MRI tomorrow. But uh, you know, I was still able to throw on it uh, through the last touchdown on Plexico and that last drive with it. So I feel I can still, you know, still still make all the throws. Just uh, just a little tight right now, a little sore. Well, we'll see what happens there on the Eli Manning watch. As for the Tony Romo watch, Mark Schlereth, all right, let me just throw the numbers out there. 345 yards on 15 completions. Again, I didn't do trig or anything like that, but that's 23 yards per completion. Technically, we refer to that as a home run ratio. Yeah, there's no question about it. And Tony Romo was great. I mean, I, I think, you know, not only led the offense, obviously, but the anticipation that he threw with and also stepped up in the face, face of pressure when the Giants decided to go after him and blitz him. Tony Romo was exceptional in those things. And the thing I like, look right here, starts with the protection. Julius Jones comes up there on the blitz, but you got people coming off the edge. Go ahead, step up in the pocket, deliver the football on time. They're thrown away from coverage right there. Falling off because you've got pressure again getting it perfectly to Witten and another beautiful pass by Tony Romo he had pocket presence about him he stood in the face of danger several different times and he took some big hits but delivered the ball on time into areas and let his receivers run to them Tony Romo was absolutely fabulous during the course of this game in his press conference you know, we have the West Coast offense we have power offense and now we have the fill it out offense Sure. I, mean, I, I love that. Yeah. Just, we're going to fill it out. I mean, if you can fill it out and throw 45. As in fill out the team, form, 60 right. yards here, so if you 47 want to yards here. For your little league team, it's to fill it out off. You know what I like? I like that. How come you didn't throw any uh, to your receivers, your wide receivers in the first half? Well, they weren't we're open. I threw it to Jason Witten. And then I went in the second half to the receiver. Be because out. they forgot to cover <laughs> Jason Witten right. in the we're first half. Okay, so all the good news for Cowboy fans out there is Tony Romo was great. They scored 45 points, but 
Merrill. <laughs> Merrill. Yeah. Wasn't Wade Phillips brought in to shore up a 3-4 Cowboy defense? He sure was. And, and there was the no hit. shoring up <laughs> Sunday night. They're trying to. They're working on that. But that's the problem. When you bring a Wade Phillips in, people immediately say, well, they'll be just like San Diego. Why? Because they play a 3-4. The problem is they didn't bring the other 11 guys that he was coaching. That's what you really need. And going down to the Cowboys, watch them in the preseason. The area of major concern for me was their defensive line. They're getting pushed off the ball. They weren't getting pressure at the quarterback. And when you look at San Diego, that's that's where it all starts. The Giants were able to run right at them. The Giants had time to throw the football. Then the run action worked. So the Cowboys have a lot of work to do. Are they going to be San Diego's defense? I don't think this year, but they must get better. And there's no question they can get better. But before you start saying they're like San Diego, you got to look at the line, line they have and the linebackers they have in San Diego. They're not the same. Well, they weren't healthy in Dallas, especially last night. Terrence Newman didn't play. That's why Plex, part of the reason he had a big game, Park. and it gets worse for the Cowboys. You talk about that comparison to the Chargers defense. Jamal Williams is there at nose tackle to eat five blockers. Jason six. Ferguson, the Cowboys guy that they're counting on to do that, now out for the season with that a torn hurts. biceps tendon. They'll have to go find somebody else. Yeah, to that short that up defense, yeah. Yeah, the boat's anchored in San Diego still right there. That short up, yeah. Yeah, they're anchored yeah. offshore. Again, Wade Phillips was in San Diego yeah. before he came to Dallas. Segway, San Diego Chargers taking on the Chicago Bears. It's like we wrote this up this way. Uh, we had time. Uh, again, this could have been a Super Bowl preview. There's North Turner, who, of course, at one time was the offensive coordinator for the Dallas Cowboys. Rex Grossman, offense is optional in this one. Oh, oh. blocking optional on Sean Phillips. Yeah, but watch the back right here. He is supposed to pick it Cedric up. He the inside to the outside, and he forgot the outside. Well, guy. Rex is like, you hit somebody, you hit, hit the wrong guy. <laughs> Later in the first, Grossman over the middle for Moose and Muhammad, and Marlon McCree hit the right guy here. Well, man, that pass is way too high. You're going to get your receiver killed being that far off target. Well, then here's another issue, and I'm not sure, Merrill, is this on Rex or on Bernard Berry in here on the pick on, by Marlon Barry, McCree? You know, like, you're trying to high low the underneath the fetter. You're trusting that wide receiver breaks in front of the safety. Look at this. I mean, he's locked it at the safety, and the ball is already gone, expecting that wide receiver to play to the pylon and underneath the safety. They had that a chat. On the wide receiver. They had a chat about that. And then LaDainian well, Tomlinson really struggled here, Merrill. Yeah, you know the number one killer in a running game is penetration. Look at the Bears. Other side of the line of scrimmage. They're defining where LT goes, but LT does a good job of getting a couple yards. Still in the first quarter or the first half, penetration, penetration, penetration. And but. penetration, what do you got to do? You got to start running some draws, some screens, Merrill. Amen. Yeah. Or take advantage of this it. direction. Oh, the only guy who did this as good as LT was sweetness. And Vess would be throwing the ball. His passer rating's ridiculous. And then a little counter move here to get LT in space. This is what Mark is talking about. Here's the adjustments North Turner made in the second half. Ah, you guys are going to get after us? Fine. We'll take that aggressiveness, use it against you, double screen him, get somebody on the guy covering LT, and we're off. And then back to the run that you were stuffing earlier. Lorenzo Neal, good block. Power O, they call it Pittsburgh. Touchdown. No penetration on that particular run. Why? Because you slowed him down. Yeah, 14 got him to thinking. three. He oh. only had 25 yards rushing, but he threw a touchdown pass, and as you see, he scampered in the end zone. Much like Marion Barber. LT's going to find a way to put points on the board for the Chargers. But let us go back, Mark, to the Chicago Bears. The numbers for Rex Grossman 12 of 23. Buck 40, a pick, a fumble. Is that the issue with the Bears offense right now, or is it something else? Well, they obviously they need to run the ball better. I mean, you cannot be a one-dimensional offense if you're in Chicago with Rex Grossman as your quarterback. But Rex Grossman, when you have these situations and you're getting that kind of pressure, because San Diego's defense pressured Chicago's offense just like the Chicago defense pressured San Diego's offense. So you've got to be able, when you've got that kind of pressure, you've got to be able to go out and get the right guys, find your guys, don't predetermine reads, and you've got to put the ball on target. As Merrill said, that's Bernard Berrien's fault right there. But I guarantee you, McCree read that from the start, looked at the eyes of Grossman. You've got to be a, a much better offense, and Grossman has to protect the ball better. He's also got to deliver it on time. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of passes that were either in the dirt, overthrown, as we saw earlier in the highlights. You know, one thing the Bears do is when they run the football, they do say, listen, we're going to get double teams. And when you play a 3-4, the double teams were there for the Chicago Bears. So the offensive line didn't have their best day either, because usually the Chicago Bear offensive line has a pretty good day. They got handled by the front three. And we talk about why Dallas isn't that great right now against the run. They don't have those three that San Diego has because they dominated the line of scrimmage. Jamal Williams, Igor Olshansky, Luis Castillo. Listen, everybody talks about the Bears defense. You better recognize what they're doing on the Ooh. defensive side of the ball in San Diego. They travel to New England next week. Bears go home for a game with Kansas City. Lots more coming on this edition of NFL Primetime. Hey, you know, one game in, I think this Randy Moss thing in New England 
just might work for the Patriots. Don't believe me? Just ask the Jets. Five, four, four, five. Favre at four, McNabb at five. Could the Eagles win again against number four? With help of five. Welcome back to Primetime. I'm Bob Holtzman in Cincinnati with the Teams at 20 update. Bengals wide receiver Chad Johnson has led the AFC in receiving yards for four straight years, but don't think that's made him complacent. In fact, Johnson told me this weekend he thinks Cincinnati's offense needs to start thinking more out of the box. Johnson said we're still relying on things we did back in 2005 and everyone has caught up to us. Johnson also admitted to me that he had an issue this week with the coaches at practice. Here's the situation. It was third and six at practice. Johnson said the safeties were pinching toward the middle of the field. The wide receivers had single coverage on the outside, and he said the way our offense is right now, they'd rather force a throw over the middle for six or seven yards than take what Johnson called an easy touchdown on the outside. Now, speaking of touchdowns, Johnson says he has quite a celebration plan for tonight. He says it'll make you laugh, and Trey, he also told me he has the entire season of touchdown celebrations scripted. Primetime rolls on with an AFC East showdown. Patriots at the Meadowlands taking on the Jets. Tom Brady and New England have prevailed in eight of the last nine meetings. Prevailed, I tell you. Uh, that's Randy Moss, a reason why they might prevail again. Uh, Mark, why aren't the Jets covering Randy Moss? Well, uh, apparently they can't cover Randy Moss. They're so afraid of Randy Moss that they're not going to touch him. They're not. They're just going to let him get free releases. I, I personally don't understand. 18-yard gain there leads to a Patriot TD. Uh, Merrill, why aren't the Jets covering Randy Moss? Well, they're actually trying, I think, you know, and this is all seriousness. I think Randy Moss, one of those guys that looks fast on tape, you know he's fast, but you don't realize how fast he is to actually get on the field. I'm sure there'll be some adjustments next time they play him this year. That's a 33-yard gain. Uh, Randy Moss is there. Mark, why aren't the Jets covering Randy Moss? Oh, you know, and one thing, nobody got physical with him at the line of scrimmage. Here's a guy that's got a hamstring injury, did not play in the preseason. You need to beat that guy up a little bit. That would lead to another Patriots TD. All right, kickoff to start the third quarter. Pat's up 14-7. to seven. Eight yards in. What are they screaming on the bench to Ellis Don't Hall? take it out. Kneel down. Kneel down. What are they go, saying now? Go, my brother. Go, my brother. Go. Go, Ellis. We, do, we, hey, we trusted you all the way, my friend. It's as if we drew it up there. That way, yeah. longest kickoff return in NFL history, 108 yards, ties the longest return in history. Eric Mangini says, "Why is this happening to me?" 21-7, still third quarter. Chad Pennington's pass broken up by Adalis Thomas, and then later in the drive, Jarvis Green, who had to play big, comes up big on Thomas Jones. You know, you know this front seven actually, we probably talk that much about them, but they have got a good front seven as well, overshadowed by their offense. And then, of course, a scary moment here. You see the right ankle for okay. Chad Pennington bent backwards and. Chad was a gamer, tried to get up, but could not walk off under his own power. Good news, he would eventually return. However, the Jets would eventually punt. Later in the third, ball on the New England 49. Why aren't the Jets covering Randy Moss? Well, technically, they are covering Randy Moss here, but they have miscalculated and misjudged the speed again. That's a 51-yard touchdown. Moss, nine receptions, 183 yards. Patriots, big, quick handshake, 38-14. That's the game of football. It's a team sport. So, uh, you know, when you have the guys around you, you have a great, you have, you have a great, you have a great supporting cast. And uh, I think that's just something that everybody's happy uh, to see uh, in our offense, just just how well it moves. So, uh, I think you can put it everything in the category. It's probably the the best well-coached team that I've been on and then also as players and talent is the best team I've been on so the whole the whole circle man is the best man and like I say man, I'm just enjoying the ride and just contribute contributing to the team of, of what I can it appears for at least one game Randy has read and memorized the Patriot Act in New England because he's drinking the Kool-Aid what they all say all right so led by Moss the Patriots receivers their new receivers had 16 of the team's 22 grabs Moss the biggest day but Wes Welker had six catches and also returned two punts, and Dante Stallworth had one 19-yard catch in his Patriot debut. All right, fellas. On Thursday night, we saw the Indianapolis Colts just steamroll the New Orleans Saints, 41-10. to New England goes on the road, week one at the Jets, steamrolls them, 38-14. to You have to think most people consider these two teams to be the front runners in the AFC, which by proxy means they're the front runners to win it all. Some of them with San Diego. So who was more impressive, do you think, week one? The Patriots on the road, or do you think it was Indy at home against the Saints? Uh, well, both were very impressive, but I'm going to go with the Indianapolis Colts against the New Orleans Saints, who were in the NFC Championship last year for a couple of reasons. 
when you're defending the world championship, you got a lot of things you got to deal with. Boredom, the mental aspect of it. But when you look what happened to them, all of the turnover, the youth, the young players that were there, that defense looked amazing. I think sometimes that helps a team because you do fight boredom. Now you've got all this fresh energy, you've got new players out there, and those new players are responding. And you also have Peyton Manning, who, hard to say this, but he gets better every single year. He understands the game and he Boy, continues to try to, to another improve. Level. Yeah, take it to another level. I'm going with the Indianapolis Colts as well. And because I think I had more question marks about them. I thought New England was going to go out and handle their business. I think the uh, New Orleans Saints are a better team than the Jets are. So I, I figured New England would go out and handle their business. What I didn't account for was the speed and athleticism on defense. All the replacements for the Indianapolis Colts. They were flying around the football. They were setting the tempo. They looked faster, meaner, stronger, and better prepared than did the New Orleans Saints and that's the thing that was most impressive to me Indianapolis looked great again look the Patriots went on the road won a tough division game the Indianapolis defense held the New Orleans Saints offense without a touchdown their only touchdown in that Thursday night game was a Jason David fumble return for a score mark it down by the way November 4th New England at Indianapolis might be an important kind. I don't know. <laughs> when we return here on primetime, the Vicless Falcons into Minnesota, were they offenseless against the Vikings? And this just in, second time around, looking a lot like the first time around for VY and the Titans. Another impressive show. Stay with us. It's a entire situation. I never pointed the finger at anybody else. I accept the responsibility for my actions and what I did. And now I have to pay the consequences for it. But in a sense, I think it will help. You know, me as a person, I got a lot to think about uh, in the next year or so. Well, clearly that was the story of the offseason. Michael Vick and his eventual guilty plea to federal felony dogfighting charges. Vick scheduled to be sentenced Monday, December 10th in Richmond, Virginia. The question now for the Falcons, did Vic's summer-long soap opera and future prison sentence sentence the franchise to a season-long of football misery? Much of that answer would be decided on how Joey Harrington played in Michael's absence. The first glance came Sunday in Minnesota. And you might want to look away. First quarter, there is no score. <laughs> Ooh, who, Atlanta? Yeah, that's Kevin Williams. He's one of the largest humans on the planet. And uh, he's not a linebacker. Not a secondary member. He's a defensive tackle. Defensive tackle and he is and he runs like a linebacker. With 54 yards on the pick six. Seven nothing. Bobby Petrino says, how's Brian Brom in Louisville right now? Meanwhile, Adrian Peterson getting it done for the Vikings offense. You like his running man? I love him. I call him the cashier because he finishes run. Look at the power behind his pads and gets yards. That was a 13-yard gain. Why not when it's 10-3? Let's get another 15. Peterson, 19 carries, 103 yards. Later on the drive, third and five, Tavares Jackson swings it out to AP. Now, they didn't throw the ball a lot to him in Oklahoma, but he can catch. You got that right there is a great example of a guy who has natural ability to catch. He didn't fight the ball, caught it, bobbled it, and then exploded. And it was beaten line. to death by people in Minnesota. <laughs> Vikings up 17-3. to three. Later in the fourth, same score under three minutes ago. It, Michael yeah. Jenkins yeah. can't catch, and Antoine Winfield can't. That's typical of the Atlanta Falcons. That's what they were all last year right there. There's no excuse for that, Michael Jenkins. you got to catch that football. Vikings win 24-3. to three. Meanwhile, Eagles and Packers. Brett Favre entered Sunday. 147 wins as a starter, one shy of trying John Elway all time. Let's just say the Eagles may work on their punt return team this week. Greg Lewis, first career punt return, balls loose. It's still loose. It's still, somebody fall on the gosh darn thing. Eventually, Tracy White of the Packers does 7 0 Green Bay. Second quarter, there's Greg grim grimacing, as were the Eagles fans and coaches. Donovan McNabb to Jason Avant. Avant over the middle, tied at 10. McNabb, sort of interesting day, 15 to 33, 184 yards, one pick, one score. Third quarter, Brett Favre is fun to watch. You know what? He's just, get off me, get off me, get away from me. Deshaun Wynn, you take it. And then somehow, inexplicably, on a third and ten, Deshaun Wynn and Favre turn this into an 18-yard scramble. And then last look one in Favre. Look, at, Favre. look at excitement. <laughs> How did he pull a groin in the celebration? How does he I do love this? this right here. I don't want it. You take it. Unbelievable. And then just two, two plays later. Uh, Far again scrambling. Jaquay Thomas says, I got you. Uh, you are mine, but you are, well, no, no, no. And he gets it to Donald Lee. And Donald Lee somehow falls forward. That drive would lead to a field goal tied at 13. Just over a minute to go, Packers punting, which is their best offensive move in this game. 
J.R. Reed much better when he's playing the low block for the Tar Heels against Duke. Yeah. Calls for the fair catch, muffs the punt. Jarrett Bush recovers. Six seconds left in regulation as the Packers have the ball. Rookie Mason Crosby. Why not? Mason Crosby, snap is high, kick is high, but it's good. Packers win it 16 to 13. McNabb bumming, but Favre ties Elway with his 148th win as we go inside the numbers. It wasn't pretty, but the Packers squeak out the three point win. Again, he ties John Elway for the most wins by a starting quarterback. Favre's first victory in his first start also came at the expense of the Keystone State, a 17-3 win over the Steelers in 1992. All this stuff about Favre is great, Merrill, but what about that Packers? Young, tough D. Young, tough is right. I'll give you a stat. I'm not big on stats, but this speaks to what this Packer defense is about. Their last five wins, they have given up a total of 11 points in those games. Only 11 points in the last five wins, but this is why they do it, because they're aggressive at the line of scrimmage. They got nine guys or eight guys at the defensive line position that can play, and this may be one of the most underrated football players in all of football. Nick Barnett, their inside linebacker, is terrific. As a core, they're outstanding, but he flashes when you study him on tape. They play man-to-man -man on the outside. They challenge every down and distance as well. They certainly do. Look out for them all season long. Meanwhile, Titans and Jags. Hello, David Garrard. Your turn to be the starting quarterback. First quarter, Jags down three. This looks great. Garrard to Broussard from 47 yards. Stop me, I'm on a roll. 7-3 yes. Jags. Garrard 17-30, 204 yards, the one touchdown. Third quarter, third and cool goal for the Titans. Well, Vince Young can still do this. I mean, he sneaks in for the score. Young 11 of 18 in the air, 78 yards, but he can run. And the story of the game was the Titans running game against that vaunted Jags defense. And they ran right at them. I know that the Jacksonville Jaguars are hurt the linebacker position, but this defensive line is supposed to be dominant. And the underrated heroes of this team, really last year and this year, has been this offensive line. Look at the running lanes. There's options there for Chris Brown. There's not just one lane. There's a couple lanes, Mark. Brown had 19 attempts, 175 yards, and then Lendell White getting into the act, Mark. Yeah, well, Lendell White getting into the act, but again, like Merrill said, look at the options and look at the running lanes right there. Huge running lanes. By the time you get the line of scrimmage, you're already going to get five yards. Lendell, 18 attempts, 66 yards, and then David Garrard scrambles to Maurice Jones-Drew. Eventually, he'll catch the ball. Boy, the Jags could do nothing. Nothing on the ground, and then he just lets it go. Titans recover the fumble. Real surprise, they walk into Jacksonville and win by three, 13 to 10. When we return on this edition of Primetime, hello, Mike Tomlin. My goodness, things look good early. Pittsburgh knows when to pick coaches, don't they? Plus, shades of John Elway for the Broncos and Jay Cutler, a late rally as they take one in Buffalo. That's just ahead. Welcome back to Primetime. I'm Sal Palantonio in Cincinnati with your Teams at 20 update. Tonight is the long-awaited debut of Willis McGahee in a Baltimore Ravens uniform and the debut of the new-look rushing offense for the Ravens, which finished last year number 25 in the league. The hope is that McGahee can give him some explosiveness, especially on the outside with that stretch running play, which they were missing the last two seasons. Making it more problematic tonight is the status of Pro Bowl left tackle Jonathan Ogden. His hyperextended big toe on his left foot, his plant foot, is still giving him problems. They'll check it out right before game time, before making the decision whether he will start. Trey? Primetime rolls on. Broncos at Bills, and that's former Bills Steve Tasker, special teamer extraordinaire inducted into the Bills Ring of Honor. Everybody loved it. First quarter, there is no score. Todd Sauerbrunn drives this punt. It's a big kick. It's terrific. The bad news is he gave it to Roscoe Parrish. And Roscoe Parrish is not stopping until he goes to celebrate somewhere near where they had Steve Tasker in the Ring of Honor. 74 yards the other way. Let's go, Buffalo. Up 7-0. Fourth quarter, Broncos down two. Jace Neal, he's so good. He always made uh, money. Oh, the win. No. Well, wait a minute. That's the not swirling different. winds of Buffalo, though. No good. It's Elam's second missed field goal. Dick Duran happy. Third and five now. JP Lossman on play action. Tries to go to Lee Evans, who, of course, is the ultimate home run threat, but oh, just out of his fingertips. Champ Bailey smiling. The Bills punt, having taken only 56 seconds off the clock. So the Broncos' final drive, second and ten. 
Well, what are we seeing here? A little scrambleosity there. Oh, scramble velocity. That's a little. Whoa, hey, wow, so, wow, yeah, that's wow, a live ball. That. Smart heads up play. Knocks it out of bounds. That sets up third and 21. And on third of 21, Cutler, nice little throw there to Javon Walker for 19. It sets up a manageable fourth down. Yeah, I thought he was big time with these laser throws, you know, being smart. They used his athleticism, getting around the corner for first downs. That's very, very smart. smart down using. right there. Okay, so later on the drive, one more time to Javon Walker, who can't quite get the first. Walker, nine catches, 119 yards. And then one more time to Javon Walker. Jason Elm, okay, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready. So about 19 seconds left, third and 10. Cutler completes this to Walker for a first down, 14 seconds left. They've got no timeouts. Do we spike the ball? Do we kick? I'm Forget I'm surprised it. they didn't Every spike. Well, they probably just said everybody off the field. So seven, six, five. Here comes Elam, and then, okay, three. Be patient, be calm. Two, one, <laughs> and just like that, it was that Money. one zen second that made the difference. Broncos win it. 15 to 14. Steelers in Cleveland. Mike Tomlin making his head coaching debut for the Berg. Opening drive, it's third and goal. Ben Roethlisberger to Heinz Ward. Hello, touch to Heinz Ward. Five yard touchdown, seven nothing Steelers. Um, Mark, there's a reason why the Ravens didn't re sign Jamal Lewis. Yeah, you know what? He just does not look like the same guy putting it on the ground right there. Obviously, he doesn't have the supporting cast around him, but he doesn't have the same punch or explosive.